Well, joining me in the studio to discuss this, Royal Commentator Fia Hagen, lovely to see you, and also Barrister Paula Rowan Adrian, how nice to see you both. Now, okay. you're both looking, you know, smiling, and I'm very pleased you're here, but my gosh, this story is not going away, is it? This is a story that is just running rampantly through the world's media, not just in this country. Mm. And, and I wonder if you're trying to follow the thread, let's start with you, Fia, because we'll go to the legal implications in a minute, mm -hmm. but if you're following the thread of how this is supposed to have happened, yeah. What do you understand could have happened here? So, from in my personal opinion, what I think potentially happened is that there was a version of the book that had that paragraph that's in the Dutch translation. So the version that names these two senior royals as the ones who had the conversations around Meghan and Harry's first child's skin color. I think that passage was perhaps in an earlier uh, version of the book, an earlier transcript, if you will, an earlier copy of it. It got legal, so the lawyers had a look and mm -hmm. said, mm -mm, this is not gonna work took the paragraph out because it's an actual paragraph. It's not a mistranslation. Mm -hmm. It's a paragraph that's actually missing from the British and every other copy. And I think it got lifted out except in a version that ended up at the Dutch publishers. Mm -hmm. That to me is the only way that that would have happened. I 100% think this is a genuine mistake. I do not think that Omid Scobie would do this deliberately because it's journalism 101 defamation libel. We're literally taught that on, on, on day one. Mm. And to put that in there, because the only defense against defamation is the truth, is being able to prove something. And the only way you'd be able to prove those conversations happened is if you recorded them, you had it on camera, or you had it on a mobile phone recording, and nobody has that. So if you can't prove it, don't write it down because it's so damaging. And Omid Scobie doesn't want to be the story. He wants his book to be the story. And I don't think he would want to be at risk of legal action and to be subject to the amount of vitriol and pile on he is now. I genuinely don't believe that this would happen deliberately. Let me bring Paula into all of this. I mean, it's, it's, it's a convoluted tale that's told. Yeah. But I mean, everybody knows that the way that a book is written is the author writes the book, but not in a kind of silo that nobody sees it until it appears mm. between hard covers. The author writes the book. There are teams of editors. There are sub-editors. And of course, in a book like this with such potential ramifications, there are teams of lawyers too. Absolutely, so it's not yes. like it comes straight from the author's quill or straight from the author's word processor and ends up in the book. That's not how it works. No. So the idea of these, this particular paragraph somehow appearing in hardcovers by accident just does seem a most remarkable thing. Plus, the only person who could have known the names is Omid Scobie. The only person who wrote the paragraph is Omid Scobie. Oh, yeah. So it's not like somebody else could have inserted it mischievously. So if he wrote it, he wrote it. He can't say he didn't write it if he did write it, can he? I'm not sure it's as simple as that, Vanessa. Right, to, be, to be To be fair to Omid. Right. So yes, you're absolutely right. There will be a score, scores of people who will trawl through various different mm. drafts mm. because there's never just the one draft mm. either. That, you know. Mm. So um, clearly somewhere along the line, whoever it is who takes responsibility for ensuring that they have the final draft, something's gone awry. Mm -hmm. um, and as Omid has uh, has rightly said, I, I can't speak Dutch. Uh, you know, I, I only speak English. I, I have no idea. <coughs> you know, once he he says yes to his, the English draft, which is what he says, uh, after that, it's out of his hands. Um, yes, and so the, I do the have draft is written by him. So it doesn't need to be able to speak Dutch. The translator is just translating what they've been sent. Mm. Well, so, as so I understand it. He says very clearly that he didn't name them in his draft. That's what I understand. But he must have named them somewhere because only he knows the name. He said he? he didn't name them in anything that was submitted, mm. right? So then how so, does anyone else get hold of it if it's not submitted? But it doesn't mean that it wasn't in a version before the final, final version that was submitted. So you, you get what I mean? Submitted so in an been... earlier version, exactly. taken out in every other version except the dark. Except the dark one. That's, that's, right. that's the only yeah. way I could think yeah. that right. it now would let's happen. Let's talk now about the implications. Let's mm -hmm. let's ask Paula about this. So it's said it's being said today that the royal family is not ruling out. Mm all possible reactions to which people immediately 
assume that the royal family might be taking a very unusual step, might decide to take legal action. Yeah. Should they make that very unusual decision, and I'm going to ask Afia whether they will in a minute, mm. but should they decide to do this, um, who do they sue? Is it Omid Scoby? Is it the publishers? Who is it? Well, that's a really good question, isn't it? Because there is going to be this trail mm. of hands, so to speak, that have been on this draft. And until we know who those hands are, it's going to be difficult. Um, I would have thought Omid would, uh, would be named. I would have thought the publishers would have been named because um, it would have been somebody working within potentially the publishing house um, that, that may be identified as the, the hand that unfortunately meant that the man manuscript went to print mm -hmm. but it, but it's very difficult to identify at this stage um, and and there are some serious questions of course that anyone thinking about taking legal action has to take on board and one of those is the minute that you step into the court arena Vanessa nothing is off the cards mm -hmm. on the other hand if we talk about defamation and what that means <clears throat> in terms of you know destruction of your reputation slurs on your personality uh, a flaw that is a illegal b immoral c incredibly unattractive you know nobody wants to be branded a racist certainly if they don't think they are one and usually if they are one they still don't want anyone to say they are mm. so so the idea that to be to be called racist to be outed in this capacity defames you does sound pretty convincing and does sound as if, you know, if you were to go to court and say, this, this defames me and I didn't do it, you know, you'd have, you, you might well have a case. Mm. Well, this is, this is the difficulty, isn't it? And you're talking about, you know, defamation in the terms of if you have suffered um, a, a racist incident. Um, you know, my big concern about this is that, you know, somebody has said that they have suffered from, a, uh, from an incident that could be deemed racist, because I know Harry and Meghan are, are now suggesting that it, that it isn't. Mm. But let's just say we're in a scenario where somebody is saying, I feel that I have been a victim of racism. They are now watching this and saying, well, my God, I, I can't say anything to anyone. I can't identify the person because how am I going to prove it? Mm. And the problem often with incidences of racism, incidences of, of, of sexual assault, etc., it's very hard mm. to identify the evidence that will allow you to say it was you. It's incredibly hard to do that. And so I worry not just about, of course, what the royal family are going through at the moment, but I also worry about people who are watching what's happening and the implications that it has as a whole. Mm -hmm. and, and so therefore, if, if somebody, if you have a client who says that so-and-so is being racist towards me, mm. whether it's an individual, whether it's an institution, whether it's a boss, whatever it is, mm. what do you say in terms of collating or collecting evidence do you say try and tape record this or try and mm. write it down immediately as soon as it happens putting the date and time so that you can say exactly where the person was when they said whatever it was they said or, or, or do you say well this is just terribly hard to record so don't bother uh, do you know what uh, unfortunately it, it's a bit of both mm -hmm. if i'm honest with you because you've, you'll go to any lawyer you'll go to any barrister and you'll say i feel that this is happening to me and my first question to you will be where's the evidence mm -hmm. so Yes, absolutely. If you can keep an up-to-date diary, a, cont a contemporaneous note, that's what all the lawyers will tell you, keep a diary. And if there's anybody else who is there who witnesses it, if they're not prepared to come forward and speak on your behalf, which often people are not, mm. then ask them to at least confirm in their own note. They don't have to sign it off, but it, it'll be in separate handwriting, different handwriting to yours, but to confirm in their own handwriting what it is they saw that happened. Vanessa, unfortunately, I have been a, a victim of racist abuse. Um, uh, I still sometimes see the people who, uh, who um, I am told uh, were racist towards me. Mm -hmm. Some of them I, I know because, uh, in, in that it happened to me. And other occasions, people have come to oh. me and said, you know, look, I'm really uncomfortable about this person. Um, I, I would be willing to support you making a claim. And often I didn't. Mm -hmm. And why often not? I didn't. Because it's hard. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, you don't want to. And if it's right that Harry and Meghan have stepped back from this allegation, mm. I can completely understand. Let me mm. ask you one more thing on legal basis, and then I want to talk to Fear about the, the, the potential for the royal family, whether it will damage oh. their reputation, that kind of a thing. But first mm. of all, Meghan corrected Oprah Winfrey. Mm. She said, it wasn't me they were talking to, it was Harry. So she wasn't in the room when the conversation happened. So mm. I'm assuming that Harry went back and <coughs> said, you'll never guess what so-and-so said. Mm. Right. So if you weren't there when it happened 
and it wasn't technically about you, but about a child as yet unborn. And also Harry and Meghan are at odds over when it happened. Harry says it was when they were just married, implying that she wasn't even pregnant with Archie. She mm. sort of says it was at a different time. But, but if she wasn't there when it happened and it wasn't said to her, and it was hearsay because he came back and said what he'd heard, oh. can she claim legally to have been racially abused or racially harassed or racially insulted by something that wasn't actually said to her in her hearing? Well, uh, it, no, is the short answer oh, to really? that question. I think she'd have difficulty. Uh -huh. um, but I, I just want to come back to one of your first points, this, this issue about the conversations, uh, conversation and when it happened. Mm. My understanding is there were a number of conversations, and I think, to be fair to Megan, she does say that in the interview with Oprah. So whilst I know that a lot of the press are identifying this discrepancy between when Harry says it was and when Megan says it was, actually, I think what Megan says in the interview is that there were a number of conversations. So on more than one occasion, this happened. We're also been led to believe from um, Obi Scobie's book that there was correspondence between uh, Meghan and King Charles about yes. this as well. Yes. Um, so, and that is again, not unusual. I can't say whether it happened in this case, but it's not unusual. Quite more often than not, when you are concerned that you are being treated less favorably on the grounds of your race, it is because of a sequence of events. It's, it's more than just an individual or isolated event. There will be a series of events that occur where you're left with no uncertain doubt that, okay, this isn't my imagination. This isn't me with a chip on my shoulder. This isn't me uh, overreacting or just having a bad day mm. because mm. a number of things have happened. And someone else has said to me on more than one occasion, I'm concerned, this is what's happening. Uh -huh. So, but in terms of, uh, of there being a a claim, so to speak, from Meghan, I, I would struggle to see where her claim would fit in this. What she, what, what I understand the position would be, if they, if they are pursuing it, is that she felt uncomfortable, uncomfortable within herself, mm. and she felt uncomfortable in relation to her, her unborn child. Right. Let, let me ask you, Fia, what mm -hmm. do you think the potential damage, if any, you might say none at all, mm. for the royal family, particularly the King and the Princess of Wales, is currently and might be as a result of this disclosure in Omi Scopey's book? To be honest, I think when it comes to this issue, people have made up their minds. Mm -hmm. You know, the people who believe that, you know, the two senior royals said this, probably already suspected that they would be the ones to say it. And the people that are just like, this is a storm in the key teacup, this is all rubbish, you know, they're going to continue to be on that side. So I don't think it's any more damaging for the royal family than it was when this originally came to light mm. in March 2021. <coughs> mm -hmm. But what I, I agree with what you said, Paula, that I think what is um, at the crux of this issue is conversations mm -hmm. about race and how we have those conversations yes. yeah. about race and also about the fact that um, the mixed race and more than one heritage population is the fastest growing population in the United Kingdom. Oh, mm. And I think that's something that we actually have to take note of. Mm. How do people describe themselves, want to be described? How do they want to talk about themselves? How do they identify themselves? How do they want to be identified? There's some people who will hear um, what Megan was talking about, the conversations and concerns over the potential child's skin colour and find that very offensive. And there were some people that won't. And that was my next question. Oh. I was going to ask you both the same question. So, so, so let me ask you first, Paula. There have been people saying, and people from all different ethnicities have said mm. it to me, I remember them ringing me at the BBC to say this to me, saying, it's a normal thing to say. You know, you, you, you often say it if the couple is mixed race. You might say, oh, I wonder which the baby's going to resemble. I wonder what... Vanessa, kind of, you say you know, if somebody's eyes. got red hair. Well, you say if, well, if one person's got blue eyes and one person's got brown saying, eyes, you know. It's really innocuous. It's not intended nastily. It is just a curiosity. People are all curious. It's something people say all the time. And, it, and people of all <clears throat> ethnicities, shades of skin, mm. you know, proclivities will will say something very, oh, I wonder what the baby's going to look like. That's what people... And some some people also phone me at the BBC to say it's deeply offensive, it's well, this, incredibly hurtful. Yeah. And if there was concern, there was concern. And that the, the idea of concern mm. implies that the darker the baby, the less welcome the baby, which and is horrible. Yes, so I just... So I'll ask Emile's Paula first the and, and then Afia, what you think of mm. this. Yeah, I think there's two things out of that, Vanessa, absolutely. The first is that we're told that there was a concern 
Yeah. And normally when these discussions are had, oh. I've had these discussions, normally when these discussions are had, it's out of curiosity. Right. It's, it's, it's one of excitement and, oh, wow, will they look like this or will they look like that? And, you know, will they be this tall, this short or will they be that tall? Mm. You know, it, it, it's in that kind of conversation that you would raise what the child would look like. That's not unusual. So it, it's, number one, this element of concern that we've been, we've been told about. Um, and secondly... I want to explore that element of concern more because I want to be fair. So let me give you an example. Uh, if somebody said to me, um, I wonder what colour our child is going to be because I'm really concerned. Mm. And my response would be, why are you concerned? Well, I'm concerned because there are racists out there in this world. And if my child is going to look like this, oh. I would worry. I've never had to deal with racists before. I don't know what it's like. Then I would sit down and I would have a conversation with them. Of course I would, and I would explore that. And I would be happy that they raised it with me. I wouldn't want them to be nervous mm. about having that conversation with me about what the colour of, the, uh, of their child's skin was going to be like. If the, other, if the conversation was, I'm concerned, why are you concerned? Well, I don't want my child to be too dark. Or, you know, I don't oh, want very, their... Very different thing. Very different. I don't want their hair to be too curly. Do you, you know, do very you, different. Do you yeah. feel similar to that? That it can, it can be said in a, in a curious way that's yeah. benign? It can be said in a kind of factual kind of a way that's not threatening or hostile or unpleasant, but also it can be said in, a, in an unpleasant way. Yeah, definitely. There's, there's absolutely two sides to this. There's blended families up and down the country who have these conversations and if you do it with love and you do it with curiosity you know as we talked about will he be will he look like me or look like you you know if you have it in that kind of way it's how it's done but also i think there's an element of the people you're discussing it with what have they been through in their life what microaggressions have they had to face i mean when it comes to Meghan markle particularly she's biracial you know she may have faced people thinking that she's white people thinking that she's trying to pass for a white person mm -hmm. that might have brought up microaggressions and things that she's faced throughout her life so therefore a discussion about the skin color of her child might have triggered her in that way. You do not know what people have been through, what nuances they may have faced, what microaggressions or out and out racism they might have faced. So that kind of discussion may be hurtful for them. And then as other people who will just look at it completely differently. So there's element, there's lots of different things about in, at play here. It's how we are having these conversations. Yes. Are we having these conversations with love? Are we having them with genuine curiosity? Or are we having it because we're concerned that you are going to be too dark? Mm -hmm. That you are too dark for I, this I have family? To, I have is to end that? this conversation here, but you can see we could talk about this for hours, as everybody indeed is, all mm -hmm. over the world. Thank you so much, both of you, for coming. Really nice to see you.